In this chapter, let's take a look at object orientation. Object orientation is a core idea of the whole Java learning. So through this section, we will be able to can clearly express what is object orientation and three of its characteristics. This is one of the tasks of this section. First of all, we need to understand what is the object orientation. Object orientation is a kind of programming idea that conforms to the human mind. Programming ideas. So as a natural person in this life, as natural human beings who deal with many things in life, we are very familiar with the human mind. Take an example. Let's driving to pick up something. So you know I'm gonna grab the keys first. And then I get in the car. Then I drive to the destination and pick up the item. That's one step, two steps, three steps. So in object orientation, how he describes. First look at his basic concept. So in the program, use objects to map things in reality. So in other words, every scene that we see in reality. In the program we use the object to describe it. For example, this car. We can also use an object in the program to describe it in an abstract way. What does a car have? Does a car have a basic? wheels, engine, and the body and so on. What are the properties of a car? So it can run. Or can it turn a corner? Or can stop? These are his behaviors. All of these things. We can form a kind of object. In other words, an object is an abstract representation of a real thing. So ready-made things. There is a connection between them. For example, we often give an example, is to put an elephant in the refrigerator. How many steps are there? We all know that there are three steps. Open the door of the refrigerator with the elephant. Put the elephant inside. Then we close the refrigerator door. So the refrigerator, people and the elephant. Are these three related? So through the program, he can also be described by objects. For example, there are several objects here. It's like dividing the problem. According to certain rules, it is divided into several independent objects. Take the example just now. Someone has a refrigerator and an elephant. Objects then these three objects. What is the connection between them? Let's say a human can open the refrigerator door. And the refrigerator can store the elephant. In other words, a refrigerator can store things. And an object can be put in it. Right. The three objects here have different functions. That's why you can look at the face. Objects are the things that make up a problem. According to certain rules, it is divided into several independent objects. A person is independent. A refrigerator is independent. Elephants are also independent. So we need to put the elephant in the refrigerator. Such a problem. We can split it into these three objects and by calling the methods of the objects. So what methods, for example, do we can? Open the refrigerator door. Is there a way to push an elephant? A way to push an elephant in. For a refrigerator, is there a way to store things if they are refrigerated? And the elephant. Does the elephant have this? It can to put in the refrigerator attribute. So, everything, every object, has its own properties or its own methods. So, of course, a program can contain more than one. So through the interplay of multiple objects, to realize the function of the application, so that when the program's functionality has changed, we only need to modify individual objects. Let's say we don't have elephants anymore. 
Let's say we load a tiger. Let's put in this other animal. At this time, we only need to change one object. The refrigerator doesn't need to move. Okay, so let's give you an example. So let's say an interviewer asks you, or someone else asks you, tell me what object orientation is. We can't say it clearly yet. Well, then, I'll tell you. Object orientation first of all. Object orientation is a kind of thought. What kind of thought is it? It is able to transform the reality. Things in reality in various forms. Abstractly represented by the objects in the program. In reality, there are various connections between things. There are various connections between things in reality. We can call the method of the object to describe the relationship to him clearly. Okay, let me summarize. What is the idea of the object orientation? First of all, the object orientation. It is the real problem. Then according to certain rules, split into multiple independent objects. Then by calling the methods of the objects to solve the problem. This way of describing things through objects and through the relationship between the objects to describe the relationship between things. This kind of thinking is object orientation. Object orientation basic form of expression is divided into three parts. The first is encapsulation. Speaking of object-oriented, you just say the words we just said. What's not enough? You've only expressed the core idea. But what are the main manifestations of it? Then you have to expand on the first encapsulation. Encapsulation is the core of object orientation. We know encapsulation. For example, if you send a courier, this is the need. People need to give you encapsulated. So encapsulation actually means it is actually hidden. So there are two layers here. The first meaning is to treat the properties and behavior of an object as an inseparable whole. So when we say that an object have attributes or behavior, so among the objects with attributes, for example, in this car, we have this wheel and tires. These are all attributes and the behavior. So we say a car can run. In that case, we say he can encapsulate its properties and behaviors into a single object. Another layer is information hiding. That is to hide the information that we don't want the outside world to know, hidden from the outside world. For example, if a student at a driving school drives a car, we only need to know how to operate the car. We don't need to know the inner workings of the car. That means there are two meanings here. Summarize. The first level is that we give it attributes and behaviors into a whole. The second layer is that we hide. The second layer is that we hide the information that we don't want the outside world to know. Okay, here's the encapsulation. Then the second inheritance. It's mainly about the relationship between the class. So inheritance, we often see the relationship between. It means that some of the parent's property can the subclass own. So in the program, we can also describe this kind of relationship. How do we describe it in the program? It's a subclass. It can inherit from the superclass. The class is this class, subclasses and superclass. Some of their functions. This function refers to the behavior. So let's say a car. So the car class, it has commonality. It also has some common functions. Then we further generate the car class. Then this time, this car class is inherited from the car class. So does the car class have all the common features and functions? Car class has, but at the same time, car class can also add car specific features. You can have the car class inherit from the car class and then extend it separately. What are the benefits of inheritance? What are the benefits of inheritance? 
First of all, you inherit the functions and attributes of the superclass. In that case, are we? Subclasses don't have to write this kind of repetitive code, so that improves the usability of the code. Okay. So we can inherit from subclasses in superclass. And we can also uniquely extend unique functions and methods. Then we can say, doesn't it increase the extensibility of the program? In short, this time, we are not only improving the usability, we can also improve the scalability. And finally, convenient for maintenance. Why? Because if say I have a superclass with 10 subclasses underneath it, then this time, all 10 subclasses inherit some of the methods in the superclass. Then if I change the superclass, then the remaining 10 subclasses. Can I modify the remaining 10 subclasses? See it, or all of them will be affected by the change. In that case, I only need to maintain the superclass. This is inheritance. The third is polymorphism. This is also the most difficult part of the interview. It's also the most difficult to talk about. Why? Because it's more abstract. Polymorphism is based on the premise of inheritance. So a superclass has multiple subclasses. So this time, so many subclasses have their own unique methods. At this point in time, as a superclass, is he able to see? Different subclasses have different behaviors. In other words, as the old saying goes, there are nine sons of the dragon. Each one is different from the other. That means, the same as a superclass. Let's take transportation as an example. Does transportation have a subclass of car? Or airplane? So, cars and airplanes are both transportation, but they do have different behaviors. Airplanes can fly in the sky. Cars can run on land. In that case, let's look at it from the point of view of superclass, from the standpoint of transportation. Each subclass has a different behavior. This is called polymorphism. Okay, let's summarize. Our object oriented. It describes things in reality. And the relationship between them. So the way he does it. Our complex problem into several objects. By calling the methods of the objects. To solve the problem. To form a program. Okay, so his characteristics are encapsulation. Inheritance and polymorphism. Encapsulation has two meanings. We can attribute and behavior. Called a whole. The second layer is, we don't want the outside world to know information to hide. This is encapsulated. Inheritance is where the subclasses can inherit the superclasses, improve the reusability of the code, extends the program, convenient maintenance. Polymorphism is the premise that there are multiple subclasses. Under inheritance, and multiple subclasses due to different behaviors. In this case, from the point of view of such superclass, different subclasses, then this time, take on different shapes. This is called polymorphism. Okay, that's all we have to say about object-oriented thinking. That's all we have to say about object-oriented thinking.